You can begin turning to uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. We're finally in the final uh, chapter of this book that we've been working ourselves through since January. Uh, if you do not have a Bible, you can reach forward into that pew back in front of you. Turn to the New Testament, which is to the right of the Bible, to page 153 of that New Testament. And uh, there you'll find where we are today in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, today we titled today's message, Submit to One Another. Submit to One Another. And this is part two of two. Last week, um, and uh, uh, we, we were looking at, uh, we started in uh, verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to read that verse, and then we're going to jump down to the, to the chapter 6 here in just a moment. Um, but as you're turning there to get to that location where we're going to begin, begin speaking, uh, let me make one announcement for you, and that is that it's, it's on the floor in the foyer. It's, it's not on a stand yet because I, I, uh, I, I forgot to bring the, 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 the pedestal in. Uh, uh, Matt Warren made the, made the poster, but I was supposed to bring the pedestal. And uh, it's me. It's me. I mean, I, 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 I remembered when I walked into the foyer, oh, you were supposed to bring the pedestal in. You know, that's just kind of how it works for me. So, uh, but it's the sign-up sheets for Ecuador for next year. Uh, and we are needing, if you are, are, are wanting to attend in January, for example, you need to go back there and sign up uh, today, really, because we are going to be purchasing those tickets fairly soon. So if you are interested in those, uh, please, please make sure you uh, go back there and sign up. And then there's two other trips that are listed uh, back there that you can begin praying about. <clears throat> so that's the announcement. So now let's, let's jump back into uh, to Ephesians chapter 6. Um, Y'all, let me just, let me kind of just preface this this morning just for a second. I, I'm, we're going to preach this passage, but I'm just going to tell you, there's been just all kinds of d different things, like from Sunday school, from the lesson that we had in Sunday school this morning, um, just for if you were not in small group in Sunday school, let me encourage you, you need to be in small group. So if, uh, if, if you were not there, that's really where you're going to grow. I'm just telling you. It's in that small group time where you're going to grow relationally, and you're also going to get to go in more depth. I mean, like on Sunday mornings, it's me just kind of, I mean, yeah, I kind of interact with you a little bit, but this is still, this is like a monologue, you know? And in Sunday school, you get to talk, you get to ask questions, you get to wrestle through theological concepts and stuff, and you grow deeper in your relationship with the Father and with each other, and it happens in small group. But, but why I'm bringing that up is because like in Sunday school this morning, <clears throat> we, were, we were looking at is it basically the question, this is Scott's paraphrase of the, of the title, was uh, does everybody go to heaven? That's the basic paraphrase of the, the Sunday school lesson this morning. And I'm just going to tell you, y'all, that's just, it's, it's gripped my heart uh, ever since we were in the class, is, is we are living in a world where that actually, there is a propagation of thought out there that, oh yeah, is, if you're a good person, if you're a good person, you're, you're going to make it. You're going you're gonna, to, you know, God loves good people. And, and then in the course of the conversation in Sunday school, it then got brought up, like, for example, we were, one of them, one of them in my class said, said, you know, just this past week, somebody said to me, how do you know that this is true? It's written by so many men. It's been translated so many times. How do you know that this is true. And, and people, and, and I'm beloved, I'm not, but this is not what I'm preaching on. I'm not going to preach on this. But I'm just going to tell you, the evidence, the evidence for this truly being the Word of God, it is so overwhelming that it's really an argument of ignorance. And the problem is, is that those who, who espouse this particular argument don't take the time. In other words, they'll, they'll listen to a little TikTok video here or there, hear somebody, and then they parrot these people, and they don't actually investigate the truth themselves. The evidence is overwhelming that this truly is the Word of God, written by over 40 authors over 1,500 years, all with a singular purpose. It is, it is not a possibility that, that this is not the, the word of God. It's just not possible. 
And, and, and there's so many other arguments that can be given to the authenticity and reliability to the Word of God. And so you have to come to the question is, is this book real? And if it is real, and it is real, then you have to ask yourself the question of, if it is real, and this is the standard that shows us how we're supposed to live life, then how are we doing so, so in other words, you and your principles cannot be the arbiter of truth. You, you determining what is, what is good isn't good enough. You, you don't get to make an opinion where the scripture has spoken. Okay? And that comes across and I don't know why this has hit me, just, but I'm really, I'm really troubled by this because even in what's said in deacon's meeting it stays in deacon's meeting unless it's something like I'm about, I'm, but I'm about to mention. Like, if we're discussing you all, we're going to keep that secret. We're just going to talk about you all behind your backs, okay? <laughs> we don't do that. We don't do that. But, but like in deacon's meeting, we talked about how uh, somebody was quoting some of the, some statistics that they had just heard this week, like I think it was on Moody Radio, I think it was, maybe. I, I can't remember where the source was, but the person was quoting statistics. And, and it's like 42%. It was something like this. This is a not exact. I, 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 this just hit me this morning when we were coming over here. But like 42% of those who claim, claim to be evangelicals. And, and just to let you know, to be evangelical, what, you are, what you're saying when you say, I'm an evangelical, you are saying that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. There is no other way. That the Bible is true. That God spoke and in speaking created the world. That he, he made a covenant with humanity and he made a way pointing, knowing that humanity could never earn their way to him. He made a way to, to get to us by sending his very own son himself in essence. God, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the second person of the Trinity came to this earth to live among us. He was born of a virgin. He lived among us. He told us the way to the Father, and then he did what you and I could not do. He died on a cross for your sin debt and for my sin debt. He, he literally, the, 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 the way, all, he who knew, this is the Bible, he who knew no sin became sin for us all. So that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. And he takes your sin and he, he buried it. He died and he left it in the grave and he rose again as the authority over sin and death. And it is no longer for those of us whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life because we cried out and said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. The moment we did that, our names were written in the Lamb's book of life and we are sealed. This is what Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 4 are all about is we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of our redemption. And he has promised that he is coming back. He says, if I, if, I, if I go, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back, and I will, I will take you with me to my place of eternity. That's what it means to be evangelical. That's what I, it means to be evangelical, is that you believe this, and not just, and not just believe it in an intellectual capacity, but, but you believe this relationally, with the one that we've been singing about this entire morning, okay? Now, the reason I'm sharing all this is because in the deacons meeting, it was like, it was like something like 42% of evangelicals said they did not believe the word of God was 100% true. How do you, how, how? How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you make life decisions on every aspect of life? How do you make life decisions on everything you do as an as any evangelical, as one who believes Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? How do you make everyday decisions on life if, if this is not true? And, and, it, and it goes right to what we're talking about today even. 
These last two weeks, we, we looked last week at the marriage relationship. H- how, do you make, how do you make life decisions as a married couple without, without a standard that show, tells you how to live life with each other? Now, 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 does that mean that life is always perfect or easy? Golly, no. My goodness, life is full of struggles. I mean, th- think about it. Think about it. Just like, like life is full of life and death. Just this week, just, just yesterday, Ted and Don and, and the, the other two brothers, Kenny and, and uh, uh, Ricky, and Ricky, they lost their mom yesterday, right? And, and this morning, this morning, Diana Durrance lost her sister. She passed away this morning. And, and just, just what do we do then? What do we do as evangelicals? Well, we, we, we intercede. We bear their burden. So, I, so actually, let me just take a brief moment and just pray for them at this second, okay? But that's what we do. So, Father, I, we, you are the one, the scriptures tell us that you, we are to cast our cares on you because you care for us. You, you tell us that you, you bear our burdens. And this is what we're learning how to do is how do we do these things in everyday aspects of life. And so, Father, I pray for both the Adams family and, and Diana's family, Father, that you as the Prince of Peace would give them peace and comfort and strength even right now and help them to walk this journey of earthly pain knowing that if these loved ones are actually yours, if their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and they had a relationship with you, that this is just a I will see you later moment. And so, Father, we, we turn this over to you saying we don't need to worry and fret and grieve the way that the world grieves. We get to turn it over to you, knowing that you are our Prince of Peace. And so, Father, I pray you give that to them. Give it to them in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so my point, though, is, is how, do we, how do we even know how to grieve? How do we know how to have a marriage relationship if the Scriptures are not that standard by which we learn the truth? And, and it's not for us to learn it and to memorize it so that we can take a test in other words, when you, when you get to the pearly gates, if you will, using a modern-day vernacular kind of phraseology, there's not going to be a, a thousand-question test to say, all right, what do you know about the Bible? And, uh, and unless you get 60% of it right, you're not getting in. You know, that's, that's not what this is about. We, this is the Father sitting here saying, I love you so much that I want your best. And because I want your best, I'm telling you what is your best. The Father did not give us his word to harm us, though the world thinks that it is, that it's this antiquated, prejudicial, bigoted book. This is the furthest thing from that. It's the furthest thing from that. And so he's he's given us this, this love letter saying, I know what's best for you. And I want you to follow what's best for you. Are you going to do it perfectly? Never. Never. You're never going to do it perfectly. But here it is. And when you submit to the Holy Spirit, to God, He equips you. He enables you to do what we learned last week, how to be a good husband. How, how to be a good wife. What well, we're going to look at today, how to be a good parent, how to be a good child, how to be a good employer, how to be a good employee. He teaches us very real and practical ways how to live in this world. And I, this, blood, this was never, this was not in my notes. This was, this was not, but we've got we've to believe this. And your opinion on the matter, it, it just doesn't matter. And, and, and this is going to be harsher than what I, what I want it to be. So here my, I'm hoping you're hearing my heart. This is going to be harsher than I want it to be. But if you don't really believe this, why are you, why are you here? I'm going to just tell you, if I did not believe this book to be true, there are a lot of things I would rather do in this world. I, 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 I hate sand, but I love the ocean. <laughs> if 
we could just pave that thing, I would just be out there all the time. But we, I'd, be, I'd be at the beach with somebody. I love, I love roller coasters. I would, I would be at a roller coaster theme park. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Bruce said we can go. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I trust, I love the Lord Jesus. I love the Lord Jesus more than I love roller coasters. And I love the Lord Jesus more than I love the ocean. And I love Jesus more than anything else. And so when he speaks to an issue and he convicts me of sin, I have only but one response, and that's to say, Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Because I'm not, this isn't what you, your plan is better than my plan, and your wants are better than my wants, and I trust you. Even when it's not coming out the way that I envision, I trust you. And so if this, if that's, I, let's come to the text. Let's come to the text. Starting there, I'm going to read verse 21 of chapter 5, and then I'm going to have us go through chapter 6, and we're going to unpack this a little bit. Verse 21 of chapter 5 says this, And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And then, and then he starts there, and he gives us all this stuff about husbands and wives that we looked at last week. And then we jump to chapter 6, and starting there in verse 1, we read these words. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Not by way of, um, of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him let's go to the father just for a moment in prayer father you know that I am um, a little disoriented this morning you know that I'm a little Emotionally out of sorts. I was, I just, after leaving Sunday school, I did, we, we did fine in class, but Lord, you know that it's just as I've been, afterwards, this has just been pondering in my mind through the song service, through the walking around, getting things set up. Father, this has just been wearing on me, and so I cast this burden onto you. And, and, I, and I pray, Father, I pray that your church, the bride of Christ, that, that First Baptist Church of Bowling Green people, that we would really understand what the Bible is and what a relationship with you looks like and how we let you work on us through your word. It's not us reading your word. It's really your word reading us. And whenever we are out of alignment with what you say on a subject, it's our responsibility to humble ourselves before you and say, oh, Lord Jesus, ch chisel that away. R remove that, that selfishness from my life. Remove that, that pride or arrogance from my, my life. Remove that pet sin 
from my life chisel it away father i i humble myself before you i i repent i i say i'm sorry examine my heart reveal to me if there's any wicked way that i might walk rightly with you and into your righteousness and into your pleasure and to your good graces N- knowing that there that there literally is no condemnation for those of us who are in you but there is a promise of being conformed into the image of your son Jesus and you take us through this process and and you know that we are growing intimately with you relationally with you day in and day out and so father I pray even right now as we begin to look even at parenting and and work I pray that we would learn what this issue of submission actually means in the family and in work and help us to even as we've been learning that we're sitting with you learning from you we're walking it out now and we're soon in the next couple of weeks going to get to standing in the battle father may we learn how to walk this out in our walk with you to your great glory to your great name be praised We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we do pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, so the first point, um, well, the the, the first verse, I I, I do want to make a reiteration because of a comment that was made to me in the last service. When we get to that thing that said, submit to one another, this is verse 21 of chapter 5, it says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, okay? And we talked out of that, out of that, that is... You know, it's what's said before, it's what's said after it. That's the context of the passage. And what we looked at on the front end of this was how we're not supposed to be like drunk on on, uh, wine because that leads to debauchery, but yet we're supposed to be filled with the Spirit. And the only way that we are able to submit to one another is when we have submitted ourselves to the Spirit and to the Spirit's control in our life. And so as we submit to the Spirit, He is filling us. Now, we talked about this even last week, how when we get saved, when we get born again, we get all of the Holy Spirit. We, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We get all of Him. But his, but his manifestational presence or evidence of Him in our life, that's what this is, be filled. And in the Greek, that's an ongoing, continually be filled. Now, you got all of Him but unless you are abiding with him, relationally abiding with him, you're not going to always feel or experience his power and presence in your life. So this is why Paul tells us here in this fifth chapter, be filled with the Spirit. So as we're being filled with the Spirit, relationally with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune God, the, the, the three are one, as we're being relationally with them, He fills us and he then enables us to do that which none of us want to do. And that is to submit. Because of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, we have all been tainted with what we call the Adamic sin nature. And what what that means is that every single one of us want to be our own God. That's, That's basically what it means. I want to run the show my way. And I think my way is right. And you think your way is right. And the problem is, is that we're both wrong. God knows what is the right way, and we submit to him, okay? So as we submit to him, he enables us to relationally submit to each other. And it's out of that that then Paul gives us some of these examples. And so again, we're not going to preach the marriage thing last week. The reason I'm emphasizing this one more time is because somebody came up to me last week and says, well, Scott, what happens when, like, if, if I were to submit, it would mean, you know, X, and you can fill in the blank, okay? Like, like, like it means that I, like, I don't, like, like I... To, like they, they tell me, no, you can't share your faith anymore, for example. That's not what they did, but I'm going to use that as an example. If, if, if somebody said to you, hey, you can't, if the government, for example, came to you and said, hey, you can't share your faith anymore, well, what, what do you do? Do you say, oh, great government, I thank you for you telling me what I can and cannot do? 
Is that, is that what they do? Okay. What if the government came to us and said, okay, you can no longer assemble as a church, as a body of believers? Do, do we say, oh, great government, thank you for your wisdom and for your understanding that, that, that the church is really irrelevant and we should listen to you? Is that what we do? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. In other words, we submit to the authority to the point that the authority conflicts with God's standard. Now, now having said that, though, having said that, when you do choose intentional rebellion from the earthly authority to submit to the higher and greater authority, the scriptures do tell us that the authority bears the sword for a reason. Okay? So in other words, like using the example, like if the, if the, if the government said, okay, you guys can't assemble together, and we say, oh, yes, we are, well, what can the government do to us? They can arrest us. They could arrest us. And we then have to sit there and say, oh, thank you, Father, for allowing me to participate in the persecution that they gave to your very own son. Do you, do you understand? So in other words, you, you submit, like, like for example, and I know some of you challenge are challenged with this. We're using the government illustrations because it's easier, okay? And I know for a fact, because I know my audience, some of you struggle with this, okay? Especially, especially when you have to go to the restroom, okay? But when, you, yeah, I'm talking to you. When, but when you see that speed limit sign that says 40 as you're hitting into Bowling Green and you got to get to the house, does, that, does it mean anything? I know, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm, so does it mean anything? When you got to go, you got to go, right? So you go. And that 40 mile an hour sign means nothing. And you even see like, police officer, just follow me to the house. Just follow me to the house. You can give me the ticket there, but we're gonna, we got to get there, right? <laughs> I live that. Now, 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 Lacey raised her hand, but Lacey is not having to go to the restroom. Lacey only has one speed. <laughs> Lacey thinks that as soon as you hit the gas, it's all the way. No. That's the, oh, oh, don't tell her, say no. That woman has passed me more times on 17, like she's, she thinks she's Mario Andretti flying by, passing the Indy Stein. I'm just, and you're like, whoa, where did it even come from? And it's, and it's Lacey McCoy, right up the road. I have no idea what you're paying in tickets, Mike, but it's, golly, bless your heart, you know? So, so my point is this, okay? When you, when you, when, when the government says 55 miles an hour is the speed limit or 60 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour, and you don't like it, and you're, you don't think it's the right decision, all right, and you choose to break it, okay? You then, however, accept the consequence when they say, here's your ticket right? Even when you don't agree with it, okay? Even when you don't agree with it. And that's what this is, that's why I'm using this as an illustration. You submit to the authority, and if you choose to break the authority, you also bear the consequences of that. But if they, if, if, even if you don't agree with the decision they've made, but if it's in contrast to the, to the higher authority, to God, you always submit to the Father, but recognize that the consequences still may come on you, Okay? Now, having said that, now we move to the parenting thing, okay? And this is where we're going to we're, we're gonna nail this part, okay? So your first point, and if you're listen, writing and you're listening, God, is this. Children, obey your parents. Thank goodness my parents have now passed. This is no longer is applied to me because, my goodness. Now, that, I'm playing. That's silly. I'm being funny, okay? I, I, would, take my, I would take my parents back every day and twice on Sunday. Man, I love my parents, okay? But obviously, we are supposed to submit to our parents no matter what our age. Phyllis. <laughs> so, when, so when you go off, you need to take your mom with you, okay? Okay? You can't just abandon your mama like that, okay? That's a, that's a, that's an, I'm right, right, Hazel? See? So, amen. Hazel said amen, okay? 
So, so Phyllis, obey your mama, okay? Obey your mama. Okay, let me keep reading here. Okay, so children, this is your first point. Children, obey your parents. Look at verses one through three. And by the way, okay, now look, moms and dads, this, I did this last week when we did the marriage thing. These verses are actually for your kids, okay? You let the Holy Spirit do the work on them. Now, you can read it to them, and you can extra- and explain it to them, but at the end of the day, you let the Holy Spirit do the work on them, okay? <clears throat> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may, li- say, uh, may, may live long on the earth. Now, I'm going to do the last part first, okay? Because it's the easiest part and it's the quickest part. But he says, okay, honor your father and mother. And then he goes and he says, which is the, which is the commandment with a promise. And then he actually tells you what the promise is. So, if you, it, so children, scripturally speaking, holistically, remember, there's times that there's promises and then there's times that there's guidelines. This is one of these, that's, that this, is a, this is one of the promises because it even says a commandment with a promise. If you have honored your father and mother, what he says is you will have long life on the earth. Now, do tragedies happen in this world? Yes. Do, do unfortunate things happen sometimes? Yes. So, so understand that this is a holistic promise to the Father, to us, if we honor our father and our mother, okay? We are living, unfortunately, in a world where this is becoming less and less the reality. Parents and kids, kids are not always honoring their parents, and parents are not always honoring their kids either, by the way. It, it's a both and. But now, so, how do, so what does this look like? How do we actually get to that place where we're actually honoring our parents? Well, that comes back to the first part, the first part. So let's go back to verse 1. So children, obey your parents in the Lord, which is, for, for this is right. So it always comes back to this. So, so kids, how is it that you do this? How do you obey your parents? In the Lord. Look, there are times that your parents are going to say things to you that you're going to sit there and go, that's stupid. My parents are, look, I'm just, just, I'm just, again, I'm just going to tell you guys, this is my own earthly experience. I thought my parents, when I became a teenager, especially when I started driving, okay, but I thought my parents were the dumbest people on the planet. No, I'm being serious. I thought they were, I just thought they were just, just ignorant people. Just so stupid. How could they not understand how the world works? I mean, that's just what I thought. Okay? The, the, but, but, but kids, the, the older I've gotten, the older I get, the more I go, oh my goodness. They were the smartest people I've ever known on the planet. They were brilliant the issue is that in their brilliance, they had lived so much in life that they knew what was best for me, but I knew what I wanted to experience. And so because I knew what I wanted to experience, I said, that's more intelligent and better than their wisdom of life. Okay? Now, I will tell you as a whole, I mean, I'm this, not always. You guys already. You have heard too many too many stories about mom and the and the paddle and dad. I mean, you've heard too many of these stories. So so you you understand. I was disciplined a lot. Okay, it, it was just a, it was a tharp privilege to be disciplined a lot. It, granted, and I and I earned every single one of the disciplines I got. All right, because uh, I was strong willed and I was stubborn and I was I I feel sorry for my parents. I really do. I was not an easy job. At the exact same time that I say those words, I really did try to comply with most of the things they said. I really did try to comply with them, okay? Now, why, would I, why was I trying to do that? Because I did get saved when I was nine years old. And I did start sensing the Spirit of God calling me into ministry when I was 14. And I did surrender to that call at 16. And so, even as a young individual, I was striving to relationally be in a right relationship with the Father, okay? 
And regularly, more than I'd like to admit, this verse the Holy Spirit used in my life. Because I would sit there and go, that is, my parents are so stupid. Why would they tell me to do that? that is, why are they not letting me do this? But I would remember this part. I'd remember this part, and it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And so what I would do is I say, even though I don't agree with this, even though I don't agree with this, Father, because of you, I will listen to them. The only way you're going to ever make it through your childhood years like this is to do that. You don't have to understand. If they are not, if your parents are telling you to do something that is not in violation to the Word of God, even if you don't understand it, just listen to them. They really do have your best interest at heart. They really do. They actually have some experience in life that can speak into your life. And so you listen to them, okay? Does that make any sense, kids, parents? And by the way, again, parents, this is not your verse on them. You can tell them about the verse, but you need to let the Holy Spirit do the convicting work, especially if they're his children, okay? Which then leads us to the second point. So children are to obey your parents, but parents... <laughs> And notice it's written to fathers, but it's, it's, it's holistically parents. But this is my spiritual gift. This verse is all, I am preaching to myself now. Okay. Thank you, honey. I appreciate that over there. Parents, do not provoke your <laughs> Parents, do not provoke your children. And this is my spiritual gift. I did it this morning, just to let you know. I wasn't even thinking about this sermon, but I was the one that awoke Alondra. <laughs> See, none of my kids like the way that I wake them. That not, not a, I'm the only morning person in the house. I'm the only morning person in the house, okay? Everybody else takes hours to wake up and to actually start to be human beings in this world. But me, I, me the moment my eyes wake up, it's like, it's a new day. Let's go embrace it. Let's go have fun. So, so, so I came in and I provoked a loner today. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. It's time to get up. She's like, leave me alone. I'm like, no, it's a good morning. She hated it. So, so verse four, verse four. Scott, listen to these verses. <laughs> fathers, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. By the way, Alondra got angry. Just to let you know. But bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. So parents, what is your responsibility? What is your responsibility? Say it again. Train the kids. That's the issue. Your kids don't know they need to be trained. They don't know it. They think they know everything, but it's your job to, what does it say there? Tr discipline and instruct, or discipline and train. D did you catch that first word? Discipline. Discipline. Beloved, I'm just telling you, part of the world's problem is, is we've been listening to the wrong sources on what love is. And, we, and because we have a wrong understanding of what love is, we fail to discipline our children. And then notice, it's, it's discipline and instruct. The whole point of the discipline is to then instruct them. In other words, they are learning in the process. There are consequences. That's the discipline. There are consequences to rebellion. If we rebel against God and we have no relationship with him, what is the consequence for us? Death, second death, eternity in the lake of fire. That is the consequence of rebellion from the Father. If I sit there and say, I do not want anything to do with God, I want no relationship with him whatsoever, he says, I will give you what you want. And there will be a cost you do not want to pay, but I will give it to you. 
And you will stand before the great white throne judgment and you will spend eternity in the lake of fire forever separated from God's love and mercy. So there's a consequence. So we are disciplining our kids to help them understand there is a consequence to rebellion. But we don't just discipline them and say, there you go, hope you enjoyed that. That's not what discipline is for. When the Father disciplines us, what does he also do with us? He also instructs us. He then starts to tell us, this is why I don't want you to do that. So parents, when you discipline your children for their rebellion, then come alongside them and you help them to understand why you did the disciplining as it relates to the Word of God. This is what the Father's standards are. And because this is what the Father's standards are, and we're wanting to learn how to live life as the Father would have us to live life, this is the right response. This is the right response, and you instruct them. And by the way, not every rebellious act is warranted of a, of a, as a, as a of corporal punishment. But we live in a world where we hear corporal punishment, and the world's like, oh my goodness. But quite frankly, there are times that that is the appropriate response. So use the, the discipline that is appropriate for the, the rebellion. Use the appropriate one. If it is corporal, use corporal. If it's taking away a toy, take away the toy. If it's sending them to their room, send them to their room. Every kid is unique. Use what is the appropriate discipline. I, true, true, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this in the sermon uh, on Wednesday for, for Ted, and, and, uh, uh, Ted and Don. Ted, his, he, he apparently had a backside of steel, and, and, there, and I'm going to tell a story about that. So his mom said, I'll take care of it. So you know how Ted's mom disciplined him? You know, castor oil. He hated castor oil. I mean, like, like hated it. So she said, the backside won't work? Open your mouth. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy. Getting his attention to instruct him and to teach him. To discipline and teach. So parents, that's your job. Okay? And not to provoke them to anger. Holy Spirit, help me. Mood number three. Number three. So children, obey your parents. Parents, do not provoke your children. Now, I've changed the terms, this, and I've done it through this whole time during the prayer time and everything. Your third point is this. Employees, obey your employers. Employees, obey your employers. But let's read the verse. This is verses 5 through 8. Notice here it says slaves. And it is talking about slaves. Okay? This is not talking about employers and employees. But this is, in our 21st century context, this is the closest parallel that we have that we can utilize to explain it, okay? But I will want to make a comment about slaves in just a moment. So slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. You notice this kind of theme that's going on. How is it that we are able to submit to our parents? How are we able to submit to our masters, our employers? How are we able to do it? As to Christ, as to Christ, as to Christ, as unto the Lord, as unto the Lord, as unto the Lord. That is how we are able to do it. So as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers. In other words, don't obey just when your employer is watching you. Obey even when your employer is not watching you not as i pleasers as men uh, uh, not not uh, excuse me uh, in, uh, not by way of eye service as men pleasers but as slaves of christ doing the will of god from the heart see with god w uh, with god with good will render service as to the lord and not to men knowing that whatever good thing each one does this he will receive back from the Lord whether slave or free okay now again let me reiterate just for a second you need to understand the Roman population 
the entire Roman world, about 25% of the entire population were slaves, okay? But where the problem comes in is when we use that terminology of slaves, we immediately take it back to like the Civil War time period of slaves. There were situations like that that did occur, but that was not the predominant purpose of slaves like that, okay? Um, the better way to kind of to kind of think of it is uh, if, if you saw the movie Gladiator, if you saw the movie Gladiator, um, Maximus, the, the general, he has a slave. He has a slave. And the, the, Maximus has a conversation with the slave because the emperor, the Caesar, has asked him to do a task that he doesn't really want to do. He, he had finished his service and he wants to go home to his family is what he wants to do. But the, the Caesar has asked him to do a, another task. So he's having a conversation in his tent with his slave, his slave. And the slave's response, basically, he says, you know, how do you feel about this? And the slave says this. He says, there are times I do that what I want to do. And then the rest of the time I do what I have to do. And in the Roman world, a lot of times the slaves, like that servant, I mean, that slave... They, they went around. Later on, that slave actually is going to come back and actually bring a, be a messenger to Maximus when he's in prison himself and, and all these things. Th they had freedom of mobility, but they were not their own. They were owned, okay? Um, another example that that one might not have hit some of you, think of the movie um, uh, with Charleston Heston, um, Ben-Hur, Ben-Hur is of a royal family of, of Israelites, but then becomes a slave, a galley slave. And at the beginning, he's, he's locked up. But then later on, he's, he's elevated, and he's still a slave, but yet he's now free to roam about. Well, then in his position as slave, his new owner actually adopts him, and then he's no longer a slave. But up to that point, he is a slave. Now, he has freedom. He moves around. He goes there and here and there, but he is still bound by the law, and the punishment of that law was death. This is the way the Roman world worked, and like I said, 25% of the Roman world was slave like that, okay? We don't obviously operate in that kind of system, at least not that kind of way. We are, we are slaves to our taxes, but, uh, but, but, but not like this, not like this time. But we can still apply these same biblical principles to our employers, so, so when we start to look at it, is how do we then as an employee, how do we submit ourselves to our employers? We are obedient to our employers according, um, according to the flesh with fear and trembling. That's how we do it from an earthly perspective. Because from an earthly perspective, if we don't do what our boss says, what can the boss do to us? Can fire us. That's the natural consequence. Okay, so with them, the fear and trembling was they could be beaten or even put to death. But for us, we're not going to be beaten and we're not going to be put to death, but we can be fired. So we serve them from the earthly, from the fleshly perspective with fear and trembling. But that's, he's saying, don't, don't be obedient like that. He's saying, but rather do it with sincerity of heart as to Christ. So now what is he telling us to do? So as an employee, you're supposed to do your job as if Jesus were your boss. That's how you're supposed to do your job. Jesus is your boss. And he's the one that you are reporting to. So do it as unto Jesus. And when you do that, what happens? He says, again, we've already read references, not by way of eye service as men pleasers. Don't do it only when your earthly boss is looking at you, but do it when your heavenly boss is looking at you. And how does your heavenly boss look at you? All the time. His eyes are always on you. So whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Okay? And then he goes on, um, but as slaves to Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. In other words, you actually want to do it. That's what it means from the heart. You're wanting to obey your boss, big G God. You want to obey God. So you're doing it from your love for him. And as a result, it has implications on your earthly employer. Okay? So you do this, so with good will, Render service. So with with realize saying, look, my boss may be a jerk, 
but I'm going to do this from a good heart. I'm going to do this willingly, and I'm going to submit to my boss. Why? Because this is honoring to God. So I do it as to the Lord and not to men. And then here's the, now here, now he, Paul doesn't leave us like that. He goes, there's also a motivation behind it. Knowing, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord. When is the Lord going to repay you for your service? Really, it's eternity. It's eternity. You are rendering a reward, but your reward is an eternal reward. And let me just tell you, you could have the absolute worst boss ever imaginable, but if you do it as unto the Lord, guess what? It is worth it. It is worth it because you're really submitting to the Father who enables you to submit to this unmanageable and unruly earthly boss. Okay? And so this is the motivation. And so he says, and then he goes in, whether slave or free. In other words, whether you are a free person or you are a slave, do it as unto the Lord. Do it as unto the Lord. Okay? So that's how employees are supposed to relate to their employers. So now let's close with this last point. This is where we're going to wrap it up. So employers govern employees as to Jesus. Employers govern employees as to Jesus. And this is the last set of verses. And masters, employers, do the same things to them. In other words, the exact same way that the slave, the employee, is supposed to serve the master, you, do, you serve your, your employee the exact same way as unto the Lord. So then let's keep reading. And give up threatening. In other words, stop using earthly tactics. Stop, give up threatening, knowing that both their master, and notice it's a capital M, knowing that their master and yours is in heaven. In other words, guess who you also report to as an employee? I mean, as an employer. You also report to God the Father. So he's sitting there saying, you also report to the exact same boss in heaven. And, and these, excuse me, and there is no partiality with him. In other words, when the father looks at you as the employer, he doesn't see you as better than the employee. And he doesn't see the employee as better than the employer. He doesn't see the slave as better than the master. And he doesn't see the master as better than the slave. The Father looks at the heart of humanity, and He judges by the heart and the intentions of man. So with you're an employer, you're an employee. Submit as unto the Lord. If you're a child or you're the parent, submit as unto the Lord. And recognize that in this entire process, the Father's sitting there saying, I know what's best. I know what is best. Listen to my counsel and submit ultimately to me that's the ultimate submission to him if you don't have a relationship with him well that's the starting point you need to start with him and then from there you then so to get the horizontal right and then the rela the, I mean the vertical right then get the horizontal correct after that okay so our musicians are going to come, and if you, it, we're going to have this time of invitation. And if you have not accepted Christ Jesus, this is the time. Maybe, maybe as we've been praying, you're sitting there saying, you know what, I need to play, pray for my boss, or I need, to, I need to pray for my employees. I, I need to pray for my kids, or my kids need to pray for me. You know, it, this is a time where we have decision. Maybe you need to join our fellowship, be, come down and say, hey, I want to be a member of First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. You can come down during this time. Whatever the Spirit of God is saying to you, you walk in obedience this, during this time. Let's go to the Father for a moment in prayer. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity that we have had to come and to, to open up your scriptures, to sing songs of praise to you, to listen to you, to have you guide us and instruct us. Father, this is your time. And Lord, I know that in some ways the, the sermon was a little weird, especially at the beginning, a little awkward. But Father, you work all things together for your glory. And you know, you knew who would be here today. You knew who would be watching online today. And as a result of knowing the audience, 
you knew exactly what they needed to hear, even if it wasn't what I had planned. And so, Father, we submit ourselves to you even right now, humbling ourselves, saying your will be done, Father, through the remainder of this service. To your glory, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.